LA. Wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Zeit, Zeit begrüßt everyone. Shalom Aleichem. Uh, good morning. A uh, good Nachmittag. A uh, good Abend. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are, Zeit begrüßt. Welcome. Uh, ich bin zufrieden, euch aufzunehmen in Nomen von California Institute für Jüdische Kultur und Sprach. I'm very happy to welcome you in the name of the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language. Uh, this is another program in our showcase of contemporary Yiddish culture. And we are so happy to have as our co-sponsor and as our technical host, again, the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish. Uh, and very shortly, uh, you will be hearing from my, my um, uh, uh, co-sponsor co and uh, leader, uh, Vivian Felsen. And also our other co-sponsor is Del Nister LA. So thank you all for attending today. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad you're joining us in real time because it's a lot more Heimlich, uh, but you do have a chance to tell your friends to watch this program later. Uh, or to watch our previous programs on our website, yiddishinstitute.org, or in, in Kurzen, Yiddishi, Yiddish with an I at the end, dot org. So I'd like to take this opportunity to also mention our next uh, California Yiddish Institute program, also in co-sponsorship with the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish, and that will be um, on December 4th, again on a Sunday, at 11 a.m. Pacific time and 2 p.m. Eastern time. And it's uh, called Animation Sings New Life into One's Popular Yiddish Programs. It, it will be presented by Jane Pepler, who is a musician, a singer, animator, and Yiddish translator. So uh, please mark your calendars and join us live for this fun multimedia event. And now, uh, before uh, I introduce our speaker, I should say that I am Miri Coral, and uh, I am the, um, the organizer uh, for the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language. Uh, and I would like to give the floor uh, before I introduce um, Michael Morgenstern to my counterpart in Toronto, Vivian Felsen of the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish. Thank you, Miri. It is a great pleasure for me to be here and I all of you begrüßen. We have a great pleasure in the world. All of you are in the name of the Committee for Yiddish by the Toronto Yiddish Federation. I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish. And it's really a um, pleasure for us to be co-hosting this program with Cycle. I want especially to thank my colleague, Sharon Power, who is behind the scenes today um, making sure that everything runs smoothly. We have not been able to run our own programs for several months now, so we're very happy to be back. And we're very happy to have Michael Morgenstern as our first speaker with such an interesting topic. So um, before, I, I, and I hope you're all going to take notes. He has a lot of information to share with us. But one of the things that I'd like you to make note of is that on November 6th, because you're getting a lot of information here. The Committee for Yiddish is going to have an all Yiddish lecture about the Holocaust poetry of Aaron Seitlin. And it's going to be given by Professor Yitzhak Niborski of Paris, completely in Yiddish. So I, I encourage you, all of you, to mark your calendars November the 6th, 2 p.m. again, Eastern Time. 11 a.m. Pacific time, and of course, there, there will be people joining us from Europe and Israel and so on. So um, now I'm going to go back to Miri, and she has some more to tell you. 
Thank you, Vivian. Uh, and Sharon, <laughs> the invisible, wonderful Sharon in the background. Uh, so it is really my great privilege to introduce to you today, Michael Morgenstern. He is a Los Angeles native and is the survivor outreach coordinator and researcher at the Holocaust Museum, Los Angeles. He frequently presents and speaks about gene genealogy research about which he has become quite an expert. In his work with the museum, Michael was also sensitized to the fact that the Holocaust brought about not only the catastrophic loss of Jewish lives, but also wiped out an entire Eastern European Yiddish civilization, the Yiddish land that produced and nurtured what the great Los Angeles Kultur Turin and survivor herself, Wilke Meisner, referred to as Nusach Yiddish, a unique way of and an outlook on life and an extraordinary culture integral to spiritual resistance during the Holocaust. As a result, Michael has been a champion of programming featuring Yiddish, and I'm proud to say a not infrequent partner with the California Yiddish Institute. His interest in Yiddish led him to study the language and uh, enabling him to dig deeply into this fascinating topic today. So I'd like to introduce you all to Michael Morgenstern. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I want to just thank Cycle and Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish so much for hosting me in this program today. So I will be sharing with you some of our lesser known history um, in the, about the Gallery of Missing Husbands and how the Jewish Daily Forward helped um, rectify this problem of family desertion in the early 20th century. Before I begin, I would just like to dedicate this presentation in uh, the memory of my dear friend, Jack Lewin, who was a proud member of Cycle. Unfortunately, he passed away earlier this year, but he was a personal friend of mine and a mentor, a um, Yiddish mentor. And so I just I wanted to dedicate this presentation in his memory. I will be talking about the Forverts, um, which is still a news organization. It's known now as the Forward. It's online, but this used to be uh, in Yiddish called the Forverts, sometimes Jewish Daily Forward or Yiddish Forward. It's all the same newspaper. Um, and I just want to clarify the images I will be sharing are actually from the National Library of Israel and Tel Aviv University because they have digitized most of the um, copies of the Forwards for its first 80 years. And I also do not work for the Forward. I don't have a professional affiliation with them. My interest in this newspaper is just a historic one and one um, having to do with family history. So I'm not speaking on their behalf. This is just my research that I will be sharing. So starting in the early 1880s, the United States received droves of Jewish immigrants coming primarily from Eastern Europe. Um, and these Jewish immigrants who were started to come in in the early 1880s, all the way throughout the 20s, were mostly Yiddish speakers. Um, and this was a significant movement in Jewish history. The uh, long story short is that most of them were fleeing pogroms and persecution. And coming to the United States, the Golden Medina, the uh, Golden Land for a Better Life. Unfortunately, well, this is generally regarded as a positive moment in our history. And it, of course, it by and large was. It was a successful one for many families. The lesser known aspect is this problem of family desertion, where many husbands or fathers seem to have disappeared in either in the process of immigration or once they came to the United States. And I'll explain a little bit about that later. But before getting into the problem itself, um, I need to give a brief history of the Forberts. So we can't talk about the Gallery of Missing Husbands and the Forberts without talking a little bit about the paper and 
Its chief founder, Abe Kahan, who was a socialist from the Russian Empire, founded the paper with others in 1897. And after, aside from a brief break in the early years, he remained the chief editor of the paper until his death in 1951. I argue that he was a pivotal figure in American Jewish history because the Forberts became the most widely read Jewish newspaper in the world. And this is a headline from the Kishin of Pogrom. You can see um, rivers of Jewish blood in Kishinev. And this was really what got it off the ground in 1903. The reporting was something that was not something like any other Yiddish newspaper in the United States was truly able to capture. And so this became within the first 10 years of its inception, a very successful and widely read newspaper, meaning its headquarters were in New York. Yiddish reading Jews or Yiddish speaking and reading Jews from all over the country and soon all over the world would read this newspaper. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Bintel brief. This was a section where readers could actually submit um, their personal problems to the paper and somebody would reply publicly here with giving them advice. And this is a very well-known book. I won't get too much into the Bintel brief now, but for anyone who is not familiar with this book, I highly recommend it. It's an anthology of some of these letters just to quickly explain. Sometimes the readers would submit a problem like, I'm falling in love with someone not Jewish. How do I write my family back home in Europe and tell them things like that? Um, and this was like a Dear Abby, which they acknowledge is actually their predecessor. And this started in 1906. A lesser known function of the Forberts was something called the personals. And these, they looked like it was this section um, here that looked something like this. So you can see here um, during this wave of immigration that I talked about, people are, um, it's easy to lose track of each other, lose track of relatives, people, mass migration and movement. So uh, readers here could just submit, um, I'm looking for my brother, or you can see here, I'm looking for my nephew. He was from this town. This is the last I heard from him. Anybody knows where he is, please write to me at this address. Or if, of course, if my nephew sees this, please write to me. Um, these personals started pretty much as early as the paper started. Um, with increasing frequency, there would be personals like this. Um, already, women who would submit something looking for their husbands who had apparently run away or disappeared. Um, these first two are kind of straightforward. You can see um, you know, these men or these um, wives are looking for their husbands. Um, but the one at the, that you can see here is actually, um, it's a little more detailed and it also indicates he's already been gone for two years. His wife has a child. Um, so again, who, um, this is the function of the personals. Who knows from him? Please inform me here. Um, sometimes they were um, a little more intense, as you can see here. Um, Avraham Ginsburg, we think he's here. His wife requested he comes home or send her a get, which I'll get into later, but this is a divorce document for those un who are unfamiliar with it. And this is an interesting one that I'm going to highlight here. Um, it has such a great photo too, which I'm going to expand. But this is not submitted by a woman. It's actually submitted by a man who's looking for his brother and his um, he acknowledges here, we haven't heard from my brother, the removal office, which isn't really relevant to our story here, but this was a Jewish organization that tried to help um, spread the Jewish community out throughout the United States to not overcrowd New York. Um, he, they sent him to Detroit. We haven't heard from him and he has a wife with two kids. So again, anyone who knows from him, please write here. So you can see throughout the first decade um, already of the paper's existence that this was a problem that people were using the forwards to help find um, spouses. In 1908, just by a coincidence, three photographs appeared at the desk of the editor, um, each of which came with a letter from the wife saying, this is a photo of my husband, um, he's missing, can you please publish this in the paper and see if any of the readers will know where he is? So the editor at that time, uh, the Sunday editor, Leon Gottlieb, showed this to Abe Kahan. 
who I mentioned earlier, and he said, what do you think we should do with this? And this gave Kahan the idea that they should make this a regular section called a gallery of missing husbands. And that's exactly what they did with these three photos. So this became in November of 1908, the first gallery of missing husbands that was printed on the back of the paper. And this is what it looks like, a gallery of missing husbands. And it, importantly, it says, right underneath it, if you recognize them and know where they are, please let their wives know. And then it gives a little bit of a description about it that I won't read. Um, a couple months later, in January, starting January of 1909, this was printed on the back page of every uh, Sunday edition of the Forbert. So once a week um, in by, and by 1909, and this is what it looks like a little more up close. So you can see the photographs of the husbands with some blurbs about each of them. And I'll show you a little bit what it, what it looks like. This is what an entry says. Uh, this is a standard one. Morris Goldberg disappeared the 28th of December last year from Chicago. His wife with a child who was one year and three months old is without means to a living and without a home. Goldberg comes from Galicia. He is of medium height, has a scar on his right cheek uh, close to the eye. So again, just an identification characteristic that anyone might be able to help identify him as. And again, everyone says underneath it, if you recognize them and know where they are, let their wives know through the forwards. What that means, by the way, if you recognize them, um, let contact the forwards and tell them that you know where let's say uh, Morris Goldberg is, you know where he is, I'd say I work with him, um, this is where I work, and then they would, um, they would contact the spouse and the family. This one's interesting here because it um, gives a little more information, a little more details about um, this man who disappeared, a little bit about, and it, here it, it says why the family thinks he disappeared. So this is Benny Miller disappeared 15 months ago from his home in Chicago. He's a market peddler and also a horse dealer. He comes from Grajevo. Um, his wife thinks he fears coming home because he owes debts, but she assures him that he does not need to fear for this. She writes that she suffers very much with the children who strongly miss their father. They keep talking about him. Hyman, his four and a half year old boy, asks every day, Mama, when will Papa come home? So you can also see, you know, not to, of course, belittle this situation, but these were also written in a way really meant to encourage the readers to understand this tragedy and, you know, maybe to be a little more enticing for them to want to help and to want to do something about this problem. Interestingly, so this, like I said, this is from January 1909. And this um, edition here, right underneath the gallery of missing husbands, this is what, probably the fourth or fifth one, um, but January 1909. There is this headline here that says missing husband comes back through the forwards and I'm, I'm not going to read the entire um, description, but it says a description from our gallery of missing husbands brings Usher Mendel Zetzman back to his family. He came back last week and was in the office of the forward and explains that unemployment drove him to leave his family. He wandered around in the West and could not get a steady job. He never intended to leave his family. So presumably, again, this is a new device the Forverts is employing. Um, most likely they put this right here to encourage the readers or the families that this is working. It's only been a few weeks, but look, somebody already came home through this system. So please, if this is you, um, if this is your family, your situation, this is like, please use this. This is successful. Another situation that here I want to uh, bring up, this is from later in 1909. This is Yechetskyo Gelman, and it even gives here his alias, as those of us with roots in the United States know that our ancestors frequently changed their names, um, sometimes even many times um, during their immigration process. But um, we, it says, you know, so it gives all the aliases, and it says here that he disappeared from Ostrog in the Russian Empire, um, the then a Russian empire. He um, is 35 years old and he lived with his wife for three years and his wife heard he was in St. Louis. 
but it says his wife is now in Russia. So she hasn't even come to the United States yet. And I guess he had stopped sending her letters or money. Um, and it said, this is, she sent, it says his wife is in Russia from where she sent us his picture and requested us that we should help him find him. You might wonder why, it, um, how in this small town in the Russian empire, this woman might have known to contact the Forberts. First of all, keep in mind by December, 1909, the gallery of missing husbands had been um, already full functioning for a little over a year. Um, this is a page from, from the Forberts from 1908. There is already an option just a, uh, again, 12 years into the paper's existence um, for a foreign subscription. Remember, I mentioned earlier that it gained ground so fast as such a, um, a popular new newspaper and as a resource. Jews in Europe by 1909 were familiar with the Forberts already. So this is important because this was not just a tool for tracing uh, runaway husbands in the United States, but um, those who had this global situation as well. By the way, if you're wondering, adjusting for inflation of $7 a year subscription is approximately $200 a year by today's standard. Sometimes um, these entries would actually come with a letter that let's say one of the children or the spouse wrote. This is an interesting one um, from the family of Meyer Tisch, September, 1909. Um, it said by this point, he disappeared four weeks ago. Um, leaving a wife and four children. And his oldest daughter, 16 years old, sent in along with this entry, this long letter of, the, of course, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can just kind of take a look at it and see some of the words that she writes. So she wrote them this letter in English, um, and then they wrote it in Yiddish for, for this section. And then I ended up translating it back into English um, for my Part of this research, but you can see here, I mean, how um, they were happy to, or happy is not the right word, but they, this was something that was important for them to include. This is Usher Zilberman, um, who left here because his wife wanted to hang up a picture of her sister-in-law in their home, and he did not like the sister-in-law, so he told her to take down the photo. She said no, and then he left and hadn't been back for a year and a half. And jumping a little ahead, this is Morris Grossman, who disappeared the same night the circus left St. Louis, and his wife thought he went away with the circus. Um, just wanted to point those out because I know they, it, this is a serious subject, of course, but um, sometimes these can be a little humorous, but I'm not trying to belittle this situation at all. This is Leon Gottlieb, the man I mentioned earlier, the Sunday editor of the Forberts who um, received these photos. So throughout the course of 1909, what they didn't really expect was the mountains of letters that they started receiving, sometimes 50 letters a day from these families with photos. Um, they were becoming a little overwhelmed. And at one point, they actually received a letter from a lawyer saying, I represent this man who you put in the gallery of missing husbands. He never left his family. His wife is willing to attest to that. Um, Turned out what happened is that this man was, he didn't give, he was a manufacturer. He didn't give someone a job and just his retribution, this man put his photo in the gallery of missing husbands. So at that point, the forwards realized, okay, we need to be careful with this. We need to start investigating all these cases. So Leon Gottlieb actually was the one who started doing the investigations. And I'm just gonna share with you a little bit, a bit about his experiences doing that throughout 1909, 1910. First of all, this is a photo of Rivington Street, Lower East Side of New York. He would uh, climb up to as many as 50 stairs a day to interview these families. Sometimes when he could even speak to the husbands, he would do so as well. And this was exhausting. This was just a daunting task to personally conduct these investigations every day for, of, um, as I mentioned, you know, what sometimes 50 letters a day coming in. Um, but he would also get letters sometimes from wives saying, this is my husband's photo. He hasn't left yet, but I suspect he's going to. So I'm sending you his photo for safekeeping. And I told him that I'm going to do that too. So that would sometimes make them think twice about leaving. Um, or 
sometimes there were men who left and before they did, they took all their photos out of the home so that they couldn't submit his photo. Um, the timing of this worked out that in 1910, when the sixth biennial conference, the National Conference of Jewish Charities met in St. Louis, it was a biennial conference met every two years. They met in St. Louis in 1910. And this year they happened to focus on family desertion because they had been talking about the subject anyway. And the timing was that they, were really intrigued by the concept of the Gallery of Missing Husbands. Just to quickly explain, the National Conference of Jewish Charities was um, this conference that where all the Jewish charitable, charitable societies around the United States would meet every two years and talk about um, certain problems and what they could do to help each other in the Jewish community. So they met in 1910 in St. Louis and they talked about the, gal the newly founded Gallery of Missing Husbands from the Farverts. From this conference, what they decided to create is the National Desertion Bureau, which started in 1911. So the following year, the National Desertion Bureau, um, which was an organization, its own organization under the auspices of the National Conference of Jewish Charities. And this is what it looked like. So the National Desertion Bureau would actually step in to help the four verts with all this work. I mentioned all the work that they were doing by themselves and they are being a newspaper, you know, they had such limited resources to be doing this whole social work by um, project by themselves. So the goal of the National Desertion Bureau was to ascertain the whereabouts of the deserters and induce them to reunite with and support their families. And if that didn't work, um, they, can, they then they looked into legal action. So from this point on, they work directly with the forwards. What this means is that the forwards still printed the Gallery of Missing Husbands um, every Sunday, but actually by 1913, they started printing it twice a week, Sundays and Wednesdays. And at its height, 1915, 1916, it's up to like three times a week they were printing it. But they work directly with the National Desertion Bureau. So uh, what the process now for a family would be they would submit information and a photograph if possible of the husband and father to their their local um their city's local jewish charity they would set pass it on to the national desertion bureau which you can see in this photo when the national desertion bureau would pass it on to the forverts and they would this is how they started printing the gallery of missing husbands working directly with this organization this is a groundbreaking organization, by the way, nothing like it existed. And the city of New York actually um, really applauded it because it was so unique. And I, of course, I, I need to say this was not, desertion was not explicitly a Jewish problem at this time. I mean, this was just something um, anywhere, but this was the Jewish community's approach. So you can see here, women are meeting with, this is one of the chief legal counsel, Monroe Goldstein and um, he's look, going over some photos, um, and you can see here that he actually has pasted on the wall um, the, some of the galleries cut out. By the way, the galleries of missing husbands, in addition to being in what was becoming the most widely circulated Jewish newspaper in the world, um, they were printed out in grocery stores in the Lower East Side, things like this. I mean, the, the point was really, it was, it was pretty hard to hide if your photo was in there. Everybody could see you. So some things that the National Desertion Bureau did um, at, the, at this point was, uh, um, I mentioned earlier that they um, wanted to take legal action against these husbands. And um, so you can see here in the case of Abraham Goodman, who abandoned his wife and four small children, um, one, one child in an, is in an orphanage. So, you know, again, I want to just emphasize again, this was a very serious and dire situation, but this was the way it would work out sometimes if the mother um, just couldn't support her children um, by herself, she would have to put one or two of them in an orphanage temporarily. Um, and it, there was a point where about um, a fifth of Jewish orphanages were um, consisted of children who had been victims of desertion um, by one parent. So you know, this is something that the National Desertion Bureau tried to make into 
uh, try to codify into laws. For example, Jewish organizations actually, as early as 1905, made child abandonment a felony instead of a misdemeanor, and they helped lobby for this. So this was um, something the Desertion Bureau worked out as well. Another case, um, as you can see with Max Bursky, 38-year-old man who disappeared five years ago, he abandoned his wife and three small children. Um, and they, it says here, they think he went to Montreal. At this time, 1911, Canada was seen as like the safe haven for family deserters because um, the extradition laws were such that Canada would not send people back to, would not send people back to the United States just on the grounds of family desertion. They didn't consider it a serious enough offense for extradition. The National Desertion Bureau in 1912 actually came up with a really clever way around this. I mentioned earlier that they were working on um, making more serious laws out of child abandonment. Um, and so they, in the one case of someone who had left and who fled to Canada, um, they got all this documentation from the family talking about how the family was now destitute, the children were suffering, um, and they couldn't support themselves. Um, they were subject to um, Jewish charities for support. What they did, again, they can't, ex the Canada can't um, extradite them at this time. So they went to the border of New York in Canada and they, um, talk to the Canadian immigration officials and they didn't say you need to send this man back here. They gave him all this documentation and said you should deport him from Canada because he's an undesirable alien. And that, by the way, actually did not mean he was sent back to the United States. He was sent back to the Russian Empire because he wasn't a U.S. citizen yet at this time. So he was sent back home, which unfortunately didn't really help the family. But from that point on, deserters sort of to think twice about fleeing to Canada because the National Desertion Bureau helped find a way around this. And by the way, as of the early 20s, um, there was actually, a, the laws for extradition did change um, for family desertion between US and Canada. This is Simon Weissman from Odessa, who came to the United States in 1907 and abandoned his wife. Keep in mind, this is from 1915. The following year, he's back in the gallery of missing husbands, except it says now his wife seems to have found out he remarried in New York. This was a problem that happened as well because um, bigamy was something that these people actually did. It was very easy to, once you're in the United States, just get remarried. If you run away, start a, a, um, want a fresh start, just get remarried. There was no background checks at that time. So this is exactly what he did. Bigamy was um, illegal, of course, and so some of these men were caught and arrested for that. Um, but quite a few of the entries here um, in the Gallery of Missing Husbands talk about this, where they, the family think they suspect he's in another city living with some another family now. Um, so this is something, and I just have to wonder, he's a chorusman singing in a hippodrome theater if he's presumably trying to lay low, I don't think that's the best way to do that, but that's his problem. Um, just notice these details here. So uh, um, this is a, another one as well, um, where the situation, it says here that his wife, more this is Morris Reich, is 21 years old, and he only disappeared um, three months after his wedding. Um, and his wife heard he's in Chicago. He, claimed he was going away for business, but he hasn't been back for six months. The wife wants to become unbound. What that means is uh, she's an aguna. So uh, I mentioned earlier about a get. A get in Jewish tradition, for a legal Jewish divorce, the husband is supposed to physically provide the wife with a get, a divorce document. Well, if they don't know where the husband is, he can't do that, and then she can't remarry. She can't legally divorce um, in Jewish tradition and get remarried. So there's a word for that. It's called an aguna, a woman who is considered trapped in a marriage because she cannot get her get. 
Um, so this is something that a few of them say as well. The wife, she just wants to become unbound, meaning she just wants to find him to get a get. She, at this point, it's not about support or reconciliation. She just wants to find him so he can get her a get. By the way, just as a quick aside, there was um, some of you have, if any of you have done family history research and you're from the Austria-Hungary area, um, a lot of times Jewish families there only were only legally mar only married by a rabbi and they had no civil ceremony, which they considered legal. Legally, in the eyes of the government, that's not a marriage. Um, and so sometimes if these men would actually do this, um, they would have a rabbinical marriage in Europe, come to the United States and then have a civil marriage with another woman. They accused them of bigamy, but legally, I mean, in a court of law, that was a little tricky because technically they were not they could make the case that they were not even ever considered married to begin with, meaning the first set of children were actually the illegitimate ones if there were children involved. Um, this is uh, Udall Levin. So um, in the course of my research, there were times where I would come across the same people multiple times. So this is him from 1915 and then I found him at least eight more times here, and by this is by 1919. It says he's been away since 1915. Um, there were times when I'd be, you know, reading through the galleries of missing husbands, and I'd come across, my, you know, I'd think to myself, oh, it's November 1917, and he's still not home. But, you know, um, I do see the same people here, and it's it, it's interesting because it shows, um, I mean, it does show some kind of a form of, it's a you know tragic desperation on their part to try to get this this man back home. Um, by 1917, 1918, they um, the gallery became pr uh, printed a little less frequently. It was maybe once every couple months, and it just took up the full page like this. Shorter descriptions. Um, interestingly, by the war years when the United States was in World War I, 1917, 1918, um, desertion actually plummeted because a lot of people wanted to stay away from the draft. And a good way to do that was to say that you uh, you're, you had a wife and children um, who were dependent on you. Um, it's a little hard to prove that if you're not with them. So um, that um, so that was just one of the reasons for that. Um, what I I just wanted to share, I found the two youngest husbands who I came across were both 19 years old and the two oldest ones were 65 and 71, which I thought was interesting. And of all the states that I came across reading these for, um, there, these the ones in white are the only states that I never saw mentioned here. So most of the United States, even Alaska, were mentioned in the Gallery of Missing Husbands. There were also um, other ways to report um, abandoned uh, you know, um, spouses who had left. So uh, this story here, it's, um, I won't read it, but it, you know, there's a photo here. Sometimes they would print of children. Um, and this one, I just wanted to share, this is a mother who abandoned her husband and two children. Incidentally, I've came across this and I actually tracked the family down. Um, I saw that they had a family tree on ancestry.com and I just sent it to them and I said, this is kind of random. I'm a researcher. I just found this. Did you? And they said, thank you for sending this. I had no idea that my grandmother did this. So it's just interesting. Just to, um, before we conclude, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Holocaust. So uh, now that the Forberts had ex um, established itself as very successful in tracking down um, people, they used this after the Holocaust to find survivors. And I had mentioned already, it has the Forberts had an international, um, you know, an international following already. And um, people would you know, so people after uh, survivors after the Holocaust in Europe, they again, remember, they knew about the Forverts. So this is a logical place to write to if you're looking for relatives who you knew were in the United States. So this says some of our survivors here um, in the towns where they're, this is um, 
in some towns of, you know, this is the town, town of Pshemeshal and some of the survivors from this town. There was also this section here, survivors who um, in Europe who are looking for their relatives in America. And each one of these paragraphs is something like this, where someone is seeking a relative in the United States. This was printed for on, on a pretty much a daily basis for years after the Holocaust. And I just wanna take a moment to appreciate the magnitude of this project. Every single day, for a few years, this is being printed. If you're one of these relatives who's being sought, that means you have to read this paper every day to see if your name is mentioned, if you have a relative who's looking for you. And there were other ways to find relatives, but this, at first, this was probably the fastest way. And this is, again, just people looking for uh, relatives who survived. And um, if anybody knows where, can, um, you know, where let's, she's looking for her aunt, um, or this is a woman who's being, sorry, her looking, her nephew is looking for her. Um, and this one is actually from my family. Um, these are some of my grandfather's cousins who I found um, that, so my grandfather had some cousins who survived and they sent put this in looking for their mutual cousins, the Laysman family, um, and their cousins who survived are looking for them. Um, and by the way, I see that um, one of their daughters is on our Zoom today. So um, when I sent this to them, um, they said, this is interesting. Our father never mentioned that we had relatives in the United States, which makes me think they probably this family probably just never read it. Uh, they never found it. I'm guessing they never they just happened to not read the paper this day, unfortunately, and they missed it. Um, and that's how this family never got in touch. The Stockfish family in Europe submitted this in the forwards looking for their Laysman cousins in Pittsburgh. The Laysmans must have never read it, unfortunately. Um, and the Stockfish family here, they ended up moving to Israel. To conclude, I'm just going to share a story about family desertion. This is a photograph here of a woman with her son taken in Warsaw around 1902. Um, and her husband has just left the United States and she is going blind. And as you can see, she has about a two-year-old son here. I know this because this is my grandfather and his mother, my great-grandmother. And this is my great-grandfather who unfortunately left them um, in Warsaw and came to the United States. And when he was in the United States um, in 1910, he petitioned for naturalization to become a US citizen. He acknowledged here, he's married. Um, he has a wife and son who live in Warsaw right now. He's living here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> And um, his petition was actually declined for, a, um, he just had a non-credible witness, which isn't really relevant to our story, but then this is 1910. In 1917, he tried again, declared his intention to become a citizen. Suddenly, as you can see here, he just said he was not married, which is not true. He was married. He did never, and my great-grandmother never divorced. Um, and the following year, again, while my while my great-grandmother um, is completely blind at this time, her son, my grandfather, was the breadwinner from, at the age of, from the age of six to eight. Um, he was supporting her um, and they did not have any, they didn't have contact with him. He was not supporting them at all from the United States. The following year in 1918, he remarried. And on his application for marriage license, not only did he lie and say he um, was currently not married, he said he had never before been married. I mentioned earlier, it was easy to do this. And the next year, he and his second wife had a son. Meanwhile, my grandfather in Poland um, continued to support his mother and put himself through medical school. And he came, and by the way, this is a document of my, that I have of my great-grandmother's from 1920, two years after my great-grandfather remarried. Um, and it says here that she is married and her means of living, she's supported by her son. Again, they never divorced. There was no divorce here. She was still mar a married woman. 
my grandfather came to the United States in 1922, and he found his father and his new um, younger brother. And um, my great grandfather actually eventually left his second family as well. But then he came back into their lives a little later uh, when my great uncle, my, my grandfather's half brother, was um, about 13, 14. And as you can imagine, my grandfather and his brother never had a great relationship with their father, but the two of them ended up developing a very special and deep relationship. Um, and my grandfather even mentored his younger brother into medicine. Um, and they both were very close and had a very loving relationship with each other. I'm gonna close with this photo of my great grandfather and his younger son, because my great grandfather read the Forverts every day and a question that I have that I will never know the answer to, I just want to know what he thought about while reading the Gallery of Missing Husbands because he is a freshman de a missing husband. And I wonder if he ever thought he'd see himself in there or what he thought while reading these stories. I'll never know the answer to this question, but um, I, you know, it's something I'd like to know, but also I, um, for his sons and his wives who were victims of this, um, they were able to have good lives. Um, and of course, both of his sons who became physicians and contributed so much to our community and our world. Um, but it's a, it's a story that in our history that is not widely known. And what I've been doing is um, translating these entries of um, Gallery of Missing Husbands because, um, and I've been making them available for our community um, to be able to use it for research. Um, so this has been my research for the last couple of years and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer as many questions as we have time for. Michael, thank you so much. That was an amazing talk. It was so interesting. And thank you so much for sharing that personal story about your grandfather and your family. That What a story. Um, there are so many things that I would like to say to you and to tell, tell the people who are here today. For example, the fact that you are learning Yiddish really by translating all these documents and doing a service at the same time. Um, I, I, I think, well, as a translator myself, I think trans that actually translating is the, a wonderful way to learn Yiddish, but you're learning so much more. We have a few um, questions in the Q&A, but before I get to them, I was debating whether to read a small passage from um, the book by Israel Medrash, who, who was my grandfather, called Montreal of Yesterday, where he talks about the Gallery of Missing Husbands. And I had decided at the beginning of this program not to do it because you have a lot to say and everything that you've said was fascinating. I am going to read it only because it answers some of the questions that you've raised and that were raised in the um in the Q&A that I've seen so far. So uh, with your permission, I'm going to try to read this. He, it, it's a chapter where he's talking about how many people, many immigrants when they first came to America had to live as boarders. They couldn't afford their own homes, so they were, they were boarders. And many of them um, lived as boarders for several years, but so he, he, he says that the um, border phenomenon had a profound impact on Jewish life, which was reflected in the press and literature and theater. And the newspaper would print many sketches and stories in which the protagonists were male or female borders. And a lot of, a, a lot, it was true of a large number of the melodramas in the Yiddish theater. A typical plot went like this. A female boarder enters a happy Jewish home. She works as a finisher in a cloak shop or a baster in a tailor shop. And although she has a fiance in the old country, she nevertheless falls in love with the husband and she turns his head 
and he abandons his family and runs off with the border to another city. So there is an answer to the question, did women ever abandon their families? So he, apparently, that even though it, it may not have happened in real life that often, it did happen. Now, and of course, in the other, the plot is reversed where a, a husband um, leaves. And I, I actually have the case in my own family too, in my grandfather's family, where his uncle deserted a wife with three children and went from Canada, from Nova Scotia to the United States. And the children ended up in an orphanage in Montreal. So those stories are very, very sad. But my, my grandfather goes on to say that when this when this actually happened in real life, a search was begun at once for the missing husband. And finding him was not a difficult task because the foreword would run his picture in the gallery of missing husbands, which in those days that we've, that we've heard from Michael was a very important feature of the newspaper. The photographs in the gallery were closely scrutinized. And in the process, Jewish immigrants often recognized someone that they had known in, in Eastern Europe. In most cases, they would recall that even in the old country, that person was a scoundrel, a swindler, and a cheat. Everyone who studied the gallery took a keen interest in identifying these people to ensure they fell into the proper hands and received the punishment they deserved. So who were the proper hands? So this is about, this is about Montreal in the early, early years. In Montreal, this gallery was studied assiduously because many of the missing people would hide in Canada, as you mentioned. Um, when the identification was made, there was a great deal of excitement. The Mr. Kaplansky of the Legal Aid Department at the Baron de Hirsch Institute, which was the institute that was a social service institute in, in, in Montreal, and you mentioned this, it was the charitable organizations who were notified. He was in charge of such matters and he was notified at once. Sometimes it turned out to be a case of mistaken identity where the man had no connection to the person whose picture appeared in the gallery of missing husbands. Occasionally, however, the identification was accurate, causing a sensation in the Jewish community. The news spread to all the sweatshops in the city and everyone talked about the man who had been recognized from the gallery, gallery about how respectable, decent and honorable he appeared to the people who had known him. And no one would have suspected him of abandoning a wife and children for an, another woman. The man, of course, was quickly arrested. And this is the interesting part and sent back to the city whence he had come. So this was written by an eyewitness in, in the early years where actually people were sent back. And I assume that they were sent back even from Canada to the United States. But as you pointed out, it was a little more complicated than that. But I want to thank you so much for your talk because you, you've really done an amazing job. So I'm, I'm gonna go now to the, um, the Q&A. So um, what the first question was, did the, were the husbands ever found? So I guess we just heard that. Yes. So uh, according to the forwards, actually, there was approximately a 70% success rate, which again, I can't vouch for that. This was as it, the 1920s, the forwards reported that they, they had a, about a 70% success rate. Also, keep in mind, you know, like I mentioned, when the National Desertion Bureau really took over the leadership of this um, particular um, pro, uh, part of the forwards, that they had so many resources at their disposal. So yes, it um, they were very successful overall. And you could even see early on that um, the little story that the forwards wrote um, about one of them coming back. So yes, but then again, you saw the man I show you earlier, Udo Levin, who had been in there for like five years straight. Not not all the time, wasn't always successful, but by and large, 
it worked at least to a degree where they could at least maybe get some support or arrange for them to just get the couple to just get a divorce. But yes, they did find people. And somebody else here asked, were child support laws, what were they like in the 1990s or the 1900s, the early 1900s? Were there any laws? Good question. It depended on the state. Um, so like I mentioned also, the Jewish community and the, especially the Jewish charity organizations had been targeting this desertion problem even before the Gallery of Missing Husbands started in 1908. And one thing that the Jewish community actually did in New York was they helped lobby for to change um, a child abandonment from a misdemeanor to a felony, which um, and some other cities ended up following suit. Like I know Boston followed suit. Um, so this is something that these Jewish organizations tried to um, to lobby for and were successful. Um, so quite and many times. Because again, they wanted everything possible to dissuade men from doing this. So yes, while it was different based on each state, um, some of the bigger the states that had some bigger cities like you know Boston, um, New York, um, you know of course Boston being in Massachusetts, um, some of these states did have those laws um, that you know started to come into effect around this time. Okay, now. Um, th th this is a question about how much did the rabbis of each community get involved? So the process after about 1911, when the National Desertion Bureau was formed, was that um, these families would first go to their local, um, their, their city's local Jewish charity uh, headquarters, and they would submit this information. They would then the Charity Society would then submit it to the National Desertion Bureau, but also to, and this, the National Desertion Bureau did this as well, would send to local synagogues or organizations um, and Landslight as well. So for those who don't know, Landslight, it's like, you know, let's say all the immigrants from Warsaw um, all have their society where they meet every second Sunday of the month, you know, that's like a Landsmannschaft. And so they would send them to local Landsman, um, you know, Landsmannschaft organizations, but um, yes, to synagogues as well, because so this all, you know, any Jewish organization um, would was supposed to be getting this information from the Jewish charities and from the National Desertion Bureau. And just of course, on the individual basis, those who read the four verts, but yes, um, you know, rabbis and community leaders certainly would be um, privy to this information. You know, if I can, if I can jump in, Vivian, just along the same line, someone asked a question about whether the National Desertion Bureau was just for Jews or was it uh, wider for others as well. Good question. So this was a Jewish organization. Um, and it was under the auspices of the uh, national uh, Jewish charities. So while it was, I will actually say that there was an organization um, that um, I believe an Irish organization that sprung up that was similar, that was modeled on it. They looked looking at the success of the National Desertion Bureau and the Jewish community um, that, you know, some other um, groups actually did come up with similar um, similar organizations. So yes, the National Desertion Bureau was a Jewish organization, but um, yes, it did have its influence. Um, one thing that comes up in the, um, in the chat box is how many people have said to you, this is a great presentation, wonderful presentation. Are you planning to write a book about it? Um, it, um, but there's a question here that I think we should answer, address, and it has to do with the rabbis and so on that you just, and the Lanzmannschaft. Why do you think that abandonment was so prevalent at the turn of the century? And I would have to think it's a, a lot of it had to do with poverty. It's a really interesting question. And actually, I'm going to 
talk a little, I mentioned the, um, the National Conference of Jewish Charities met in St. Louis in 1910 to discuss this. They actually, and you can actually read the 100 page um, discussion about this at that conference, they actually concluded then that it was less connected to poverty than we might think. That being said, of course, it, you know, yes, that was certainly a factor. And this is what that man I quoted earlier, actually, in the foreverts, he, he said it was unemployment and, you know, just taking his word for it without having any way of corroborating his story. I mean, that's what he says. And I, of course, keep in mind that Jewish charity organizations around the United States at this time would help families, meaning if someone was just suffering with poverty, to just get up and leave and look for work in another city, it would be more practical to maybe receive aid from the charity while looking for work in the local city, you know, that just to keep that in mind. But yes, this absolutely was um, a factor. The research at the time in the, you know, early 1910s concluded that it mostly had to do with immigration. By the way, there are quite a few entries in the gallery of missing husbands um, as well that are about people who were born in the United States. Um, the vast majority of them though were immigrants. And it, there is also um, some scholarship available on this subject that um, about how it was connected to immigration in many cases, because a lot of times, you know, men who came from a very certain order of things in Europe would have come to the United States oftentimes before the wife and children would join them. And spending, let's say, a year or two alone in the United States, I mean, even let's just say in New York, felt like the Wild West to them. And, you know, it was a totally new sort of environment. And unfortunately, this is something that led a lot of these men to just decide they want to start over. Yeah, I, I mean, I recall reading one or two entries of young men writing in their, 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 their wives writing in. Their husbands were young and they already had seven or eight children and there was hardly any money coming in. And I, I suppose that there were times when the husband was just overwhelmed. Of course. And, and, and yes, there are times as I mean, the well. The wives were for sure, but the husbands. Of course. Of course, there were times, you know, let's say they have five children, one of them's on the way, they don't have fathers unemployed. Right. I, I also just want to clarify to our audience, and I'm, I'm sure this is coming across anyway, I just want to clarify, um, you know, I'm by no means excusing this behavior. I'm just simply explaining from the position specifically of the research that was conducted at this time, you know, around 1910, this is what the research said back then. Um, of course, this is, I'm not excusing any of this behavior, but this is just, this is what the contemporary explanation was. You have, Michael, do you have, do you have a sense of how many, uh, what percentage were women? Who, who, how many women did you come across? I know you mentioned one, one of them, but right. was that right. Was it a tiny, tiny percentage or? or no, it's hard to say the again. percentage. Keep in mind the woman who I showed you who oh, left God. her family, that's not part of the gallery of missing husbands because she wasn't mm -hmm. a husband. It was just every now and then you would see the personals that I started by showing you. In the personals, you sometimes see that. Um, it was honestly just not as common. It's That being said, it's more common than we might think, but it's every now and then a woman would do this as well. But for the most part, mentions of desertion in the forwards were um, by men. And, and the only other question I had was, what sparked your interest in pursuing this research? Obviously, you have your own personal history, uh, which is fascinating uh, in and of itself. But was there anything else that led you to go deep in, deep dive into this in such an incredible way? A couple of things. So first, yes, of course, I have a personal family history connection to the subject, and I'm a longtime genealogy researcher um, since I was 16, so about 16 years now. And um, the story, actually, of my great-grandfather 
leaving his wife and son and coming to the United States and um, remarrying. That story actually is what sparked my interest that's now been about half my life. So this subject is just interesting to me, but specifically, you know, trying to, talking early on, I remember talking about this part of my family history with my family, with my dad, my grandmother, and it seemed like nobody really, it was something nobody had ever really wanted to think about, which I understand because of course this was such a painful part of my grandfather's life, his mother's life. And I understand why nobody ever really wanted to think about my great grandfather and why he did what he did. I was interested. And by the way, I, his second son who we talked about, I was very close to him. My grandfather died before I was born, but I was very close to my great uncle Leon. And it, I talked with him about this at great length too. And he of course was a victim as well, given that um, his, you know, I mean, his father left him for some time, but he, he also had never really, I don't think, I think it was just a painful subject for everyone, but I was interested in thinking what would drive someone to do this? How common was it? Was this something that other families experienced and Real. I, while I was reading a little bit about the subject a couple of years ago, I found out about the gallery of missing husbands. And then a couple of years ago during quarantine, um, when I had a lot of time, I decided I'm going to use this time since at that point my Yiddish was good enough that I could read them and understand them and translate them. I thought I'm going to use this time to start translating these and make them public for the Jewish genealogy community. Uh, that's kind of a long answer, but that's essentially what my interest is in this subject. Thank you. Well, are you um, are you indeed planning to write a book? And maybe there's someone in our audience who can steer Michael in the right direction with a publisher or an agent. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, yes, I am in fact interested in writing a book, and I'm um, I am actually already already starting to write. So. Um, so yes, I am writing a book about this subject. Which is very, very, very worthwhile. Uh, yes. Vivian, would you like to? Yeah, that, that I was just going to say. Just finish this up. Yeah. Another question that probably it hasn't been raised yet. It, any sense that some desertions came from the fact that marriages were arranged and there were some arranged marriages that were not happy to begin with? Right. Yes. This, and that actually, it alludes to what I mentioned earlier, um, connecting it to immigration. And, you know, the husband started with this very specifically kind of regimented, for lack of a better word, life. Um, where, you know, most people married at 18, had families and um, coming to the United States on their, specifically when they would come on their own for the first year or two, really kind of opened up some people's eyes to what, freedom looks like and unfortunately and like I said in their case um, that for them ended up being something painful for their wives and children back home but yes um, you know they could see here in the United States people didn't necessarily people didn't necessarily marry right at 18 um, and you know there was some courtships were a little freer back things like that um, so I do think that that had some some influence on some of these husbands. And by the way, there were often times where there was a, mar um, a married couple, but the families didn't approve of the marriage. And that, you know, that was actually a factor that's cited as well in this research um, from the time. But yes, I do think, um, I do think that that is, was a factor. Well, I, I, I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you to Miri for organizing this. Thank you to Michael for, for a really illuminating talk. And thank you to all of you for coming because there, we, we have a big audience here. And Michael, you'll, you'll get to see all the comments later on. You have some wonderful comments here. Well, thank you so, so much. I thank actually you. do see that somebody asked, um, what happened to my great-grandmother. Thank you for asking. I, I would like to share that she stayed in Warsaw. 
until 1938 when my grandfather fortunately realized it was time for him to send her out of there. And my grandfather at that time was um, practicing and uh, living and practicing medicine in Mexico. And he actually arranged for her to come from Poland to Mexico where she lived for the rest of her life and got to know all four of her grandchildren. Nice ending, very nice. Thank you, thank you so much, Michael. Wonderful talk, thank you. Thank you, Vivian, for your, you know, co-leading co this. And Sharon, of course, for, for being the, the technical maven behind everything. Thank you so much, all of you, thank you. Shane, I'm done. Thank you. I hope to see you November 6th for Yitzhak Niborski and uh, December 4th for our, our wonderful um, talk about animation as well. Take thank care. You. Thank, you. thank, thank you. you so much, Vivian and Miri, and thank you, Sharon, as well. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.